Today I'm just going to talk about autism girls and something I've defined as, as autism, O-U-G-H-T-I-S-M, which I think affects probably everyone in here. Um, so I'm going to look at autism as a diagnosis, autism as difference, autism and girls, and defining autism. I mean, a lot of you know about the history of autism, but I'm going to put it in context, really. Um, Leo Kanner is the person who's sort of described as discovering autism. Um, this was in 1943. He published a paper, Autistic Disturbances of Effective Contact. Um, the idea, really, was that he was observing children, and he was observing mostly boys. Um, he claimed that the children that he observed, and to use his words, markedly and uniquely differed from anything reported so far. So marked and unique. And he described um, how consideration was needed of their fascinating peculiarities. Um, at the time, he was talking about this being really rare, but now we are talking about autism as, as a much, um, much bigger thing, really. So we've got reports now saying one in 88 um, people within the UK. And in, in America now, they're, they're saying much larger figures, actually, one in 59. So it's not quite so marked and unique as he was describing. So the first diagnosis, so when did that arrive? So they contributed to the first formal diagnosis for autism in 1956. And this diagnosis, when they talked about it, looked at lack of effective contact and repetitive and ritualistic behaviours, which must be of an elaborate kind. So that's easy then, we just have to spot that in everyone and that's the job done. Um, Silverman, talking about Kanner, stated that his genius was to identify a set of stable traits in the midst of such a vast variation. Stable. So that's quite easy as well then, okay? Which I think I'll describe later how it's not. Um, so, as with any condition, Lorna Wing said that it was identifiable only from a pattern of observable behaviour. So it's very difficult when you're just observing behaviours and trying to kind of work out how they compare next to what you describe as, and I'm going to quote, normal behaviours, and how they differ, and does that reach the, the diagnosis, really? Um, but what Lorna Wing was saying was actually there's variations, and these variations differ from person to person. And one of my favourite sayings about autism is, if you've met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism. What Kanna didn't consider, actually, is that autistic children become autistic adults. And when autism first went into the diagnostic criteria, it was called childhood autism. But what happened to the adults? We now know we have lots of autistic adults. We have adults being diagnosed in adulthood that have been missed for many, many years. And I'm going to walk around and shout, because I know that's there. Um, so the spectrum was described initially. So I think lots of people think of the autism spectrum like this. So maybe you have someone with very severe autism on this end, um, and then someone on this end with very mild autism, with maybe the thinking being that they're not challenged so much, so they're kind of all right, really, maybe don't need so much support. And people down this end, very severe autism, maybe need a lot of support. So um, they need help and Maybe they can get on with it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but we kind of think differently about the spectrum now. What we know is you have some people who might have very um, observable autism. So somebody who maybe doesn't have a lot of experience of autism might meet them and think, actually, I think they're autistic. And then we have, might have people kind of up here who someone who doesn't know about autism might meet them and they might not realise they're autistic 
But actually, they might really need help. They might really be struggling. We were talking earlier about anxiety. You might have some people who maybe not visibly very autistic, but their levels of anxiety might be really, really high. Um, they might be very depressed. They might be suicidal. They might be self-harming. So yes, they might not be sort of observably autistic, but that doesn't mean to say they are not struggling. But even that's quite fixed. I prefer to think of the spectrum like this. Um, I'd like it to be moving, but I'm not that clever. Um, somebody might have a day. Actually, they're functioning OK. They can maybe go to work. They can go to school. They might be able to go out with their friends. OK? But the next day, they might crash. They might have used up all of their reserves. They may be in sensory overload. It might just be that they've gone out to a place where their sensory um, stimulation has, has gone into overdrive. So actually, it's moving all the time. So you've met one autistic child, you've met one autistic child, but you've, one, you've met one autistic child on one day. You've met them on one day. Tomorrow, their difficulties or their strengths might be very different. That makes diagnosis easy as well, doesn't it? <laughs> so, is autism an impairment? They use impairment a lot in diagnostic terms. A disability? Is it a disorder? Is it a condition? Or is it a different ability? Our autistic children and our autistic adults have lots of challenges but they also have lots of strengths and lots of abilities. And actually, if some of the challenges are, meant, are met, some of those abilities can shine. So the term disorder, I'm not a fan of, I suppose, because it, it suggests something has gone awry, something has gone wrong, OK? So um, Baron Cohen said that the term disorder implies that the natural order has gone awry and that a person's cognition is dysfunctional in some way. But when we examine the cognition and biology of autism, arguably what we see is not evidence of dysfunction, but rather evidence of difference. It's very difficult though if you're a parent of a child who's really struggling. Because when they're really struggling, it's very hard to see them as having different abilities and feel very positive when you're sort of battling with everyday stuff. But sometimes the everyday stuff is because needs aren't being met, and because they're having to sort of battle against challenges. And we're talking about autism here um, as, as it's sort of standalone thing, not autism and learning difficulties, autism and depression. Aut you know, so it's trying to kind of pick it apart, really. So is it a disability or a different ability? So disability refers to the marginalisation of people due to the unhelpful ways in which society chooses to respond to those who are deemed different from the norm. Okay? So if you put somebody in a wheelchair by steps and go, come on, everybody else manages steps, you know, they're going to struggle, aren't they? And I think with some of our autistic children, maybe at school or maybe in different environments, they're, they're a little bit like that. It's like they're on the wheelchair at the bottom of the steps. So autism, we could say, is only a disability if society chooses to, it, to make it one. So we can enable or we can disable autistic people. Oops. So the traditional signs of autism, uh, when we're looking at diagnostic criteria, and a lot of criteria are based on sort of very sort of traditional known things, uh, language delay and a lack of language for communication with others, uh, a reduction of interaction with others and an absence of social interest, reduced eye contact and use of gesture, uh, reduced or absent imagination and pretend play, um, and repetitive and restrictive behaviours, and the sensory stimuli stuff. So again, I suppose if we're going to say we're going to give a diagnosis to a young person or an adult who's autistic, we're going to be ticking all those boxes, aren't we? No. <laughs> it's not that easy. We know so much more now. It's different for girls 
And I'm going to say girls, but at the end I'm going to say, actually, I think there's some boys like this as well. So hold that in mind too. Um, so, language. Delayed language. Lack of use of language. Actually... Autistic girls can use social mimicry. They can be really chatty. They can probably be a bit over chatty on occasions. Um, they can be overly sociable. Um, and they may present with an almost constant use of language. Miss, miss, miss. The one that wants to talk all the time. But that's not fitting that kind of criteria. And then not being sociable. Autistic girls might actually have a really strong desire to be liked by their peers. They might work really hard at it. They might actually study their friends and work out what they like, what they don't like, how to be like them. Um, and they're less likely to use social isolation as a coping strategy. So again, they're not going to stick out in the same way. And really, the girls, they're hiding in plain sight. So. Adult autistic women show fewer signs of social communication difficulties, um, suggesting that there's been more motivation to learn as they've gone along um, and more strategies that they've put in place to appear socially able. Um, autistic women and girls are more likely to mask and camouflage, so try not to be spotted as autistic, so kind of hold it in all day. Um, and there's little research actually on the impact of camouflaging on the mental health and, and depression and anxiety, although there's an increasing interest in this area now, so I think there's more to come. And um, we had Fiona earlier talking about anxiety. What we know is there are high levels of anxiety for autistic girls. Um, and they experience um, greater difficulties than males with anxiety and social problems and thought problems. And autistic females present with more internalising problems than autistic males. So again, that kind of holding it in. So this makes it harder for our girls to be spotted at school. Um, and they're three times less likely to be um, referred in by preschool teachers than boys, or 13 times, sorry. Um, autistic boys are reported to have more difficulty adapting their behaviour to the environment at school. And research has shown, as I said, yeah, 13 times less likely to be referred and picked up. So this means that they're challenges are more likely to be picked up when their behaviour becomes difficult at home. So you've got the parents thinking, what is going on here? Things are fine at school. I've spoken to the teacher. The teacher's told me she's lovely, she's working really hard. She comes home, whoa. Okay. Um, and I think that creates a real risk of parents being then seen as over anxious because as parents you're going into school you're saying I don't know what's going on she came out she hit me she was tearful she smashed a bedroom up she's hit her brother and they're like well really don't know what you're on about Mrs Evans everything seems fine here yeah and autistic girls can be highly imaginative so again, not fitting that sort of tick box criteria at the beginning that I described. Um, sometimes, actually, their imaginary worlds will become a safe place. So they might even overuse that imagination, really. Um, and whilst they will play with other children, maybe using um, imaginary games, they might have a strong desire to control that. So, no, I said you were going to be that, and you're going to do this, and you haven't done it right, and we're going to play like this now. Um, and actually, you might see that play might be acting out things that have been seen in the day. So play might be quite often stuff like playing schools or playing shops or playing things that they've been in places that they've seen. So whatever autistic is meant to look like, autistic girls are less likely to look at. So... Research says that autistic girls are less likely to present with restricted and repetitive interests and behaviours. Again, those are the things that other people are more likely to spot and to sort of identify to them, that there might be something that's slightly different about a child. Um, their interests are likely to be more in line with their peers. So yes, their friend likes Build-A-Bear, they like Build-A-Bear, but their friend hasn't had to have everyone in every colour, and they haven't had to line them up in the order of when they bought them, and they won't hit their mum if they move them. So it's that kind of difference, really. Um, and actually, 
a lot of the research on diagnosis for autism has been based on the diagnosis of boys and the diagnosis of men. So that again makes um, assessment and diagnosis for girls much harder. And as I said at the beginning, I think there's a whole lot of boys out there that would fit the girl type of autism. And I think maybe along the way we'll stop calling it girl type autism and we'll start thinking about how to describe it very differently. <coughs> And actually, should we even use the term autism? I sometimes question it. Um, autism comes from the Greek word autos, which means self. So it describes a person who wants to be by themselves. And that suggests all autistic people want to be by themselves all the time. And do they really? That's not necessarily the case. They might find social interaction challenging at times or difficult, or they might wish people would interact in a slightly different way and think that some of the neurotypical um, rituals that we go through are quite stupid. Um, but that doesn't mean to say they want to be isolated and by themselves. And actually, then, if people think that, does that really confuse understanding about autism? In fact, I think the more we know about autism, I think the more we realise we don't know about autism. But one thing I have picked up is around autism, there is lots of autisms. So if we think about ought, so ought describes a duty or a correctedness, a correctness typically when criticising somebody's actions, so how they ought to be. Um, something that's probable, how something should be. And if you think about ism, so ism is a, a practice or system or philosophy, typically a political ideology or an artistic movement. So when we put those together, we get autism. So the practice of criticising others, telling others how they should or shouldn't be, and questioning their actions or beliefs. Someone is being autistic if they are telling someone how they should manage their child's behaviour or how they should or shouldn't be. Hands up, has anybody here experienced autism? Yeah, a few. Okay, good. Yeah, put my hand up. I think any family, actually, where there's a child that's autistic or an adult that's autistic or an individual that's autistic will have experienced autism. And I think there's both internal autisms. So autism is actually you put on yourself how you think it ought to be or you're telling yourself it ought to be and autisms that you experience from other people. And actually, if we think about Fiona's um, presentation and about anxiety, I would say autisms are a really big cause of anxiety for parents of autistic children. And if they make you more anxious, then there's more chance that you will struggle to manage your child's anxiety because you're already on a five yourself. And I think autisms can put you on that five. So I've, I've given an example of some autisms that I'm aware of. Um, what you think you, so internal autism, so it's what you think you ought to do when your child refuses to do something. I don't know if people have got like a little invisible people on their shoulder, or oh, you really oughtn't do that. You ought to be able to tell him what to do now. What kind of parent are you? You ought to be able to get him to get his socks on and get out the door without this kind of trouble. What's going on? Um, how you think family events ought to be? You know, that nice Christmas dinner when everyone sat around happily chatting and eating their dinner. That's nice, isn't it? That's how it ought to be, isn't it? Um, how you ought to feel about autism. Uh, what you think you ought to do about school for your child. You ought to go to mainstream versus you ought to go to special school. Um, because some autisms contradict each other, which can be very tricky. Um, how you think you ought to fit in how you think you ought to fit in when you go to an event or when you go out with friends with their children, um, how you ought to be able to just cope with things that are challenging, just ought to be able to get on with it, um, and how you ought to have family meals together, because there's lots of autisms about family meals. It's okay. Right. I'm nearly there, I've got two minutes. So, um, examples of external autisms. Uh, you ought to leave him with me for a week and I'd sort him out. That's a good one. Um, you ought to look autistic. 
So that seems to come across like, you know, you don't look like you're autistic. So apparently there's a way you ought to look if you're autistic. Um, you ought to discipline him more. That would sort things out. Easy. There you go. Uh, you shouldn't seek to label your child. Yeah? You ought not to. Uh, you ought to avoid eye contact if you are autistic. Spelling mistake, like that. Um, so apparently that's it. You ought to be able to just avoid eye contact, and if not, then you're not autistic. Um, you ought to say child with autism, not autistic child. There's lots of autisms around how we even describe autism or being autistic. Uh, you ought to try and fit in. You ought to change your behaviour. You ought to be like everyone else. And your family ought to be like every other family. Oh, and you ought to like trains or Pokemon as well. <laughs> there are lots and lots of autisms. Yeah. So I suppose the challenge for us is to um, challenge medical language around autism. Um, the main focus is around sort of always about cause and prevalence and impairment. And I think we need to be able to move away from that. We need to be able to look at strengths and how to support families to, to help their children or autistic family members shine. Um, we need to be curious about what's created um, with families and individuals by autism narratives and autism before and after diagnosis. Um, <coughs> I suppose we need to help people to have the lives that they ought to have. Thank you.